Thank you so much for being here this evening. It's truly a pleasure and an honor to be able to preach the gospel to you. I truly appreciate the, the text and, and uh, messages that is said or uh, sent to me during the week. And, and uh, I just remember Dwight sent me a message this morning. I greatly appreciate that. You'll think that's a really big deal, but it is. And, you know, even just a few words that was said here, you know, just in a message and and I'm always uh, being kept tabs on on Sunday nights as well because they want to know if I made it home. Nathan's usually in charge of that. So I do appreciate how everybody has uh, um, always been concerned about my well-being as I travel. And I greatly appreciate having the opportunity to come here. Uh, and it's also great to have my son here. Uh, now, I told him, I said, that's Larry's seat back here. But for some reason, he thinks that he's just uh, big enough to whip up on Larry, I guess. So, uh, But, the, you know, it's great to have him here. I was hoping Allison would be here, but I understand um, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, it's, it's just always nice to have your kids around when you're preaching the message, especially when my uh, about two-thirds of my children are getting ready to be out the door. So um, with those things being said, let's go to our message here tonight. And my message here tonight is, what is the social gospel? And you may not think that's an issue in this world today, but it, it's very evident that it is a problem. And the reason being is because we have kind of went away with the pattern of the New Testament, and we want to cling on to newer and better and, and more ideal things when it comes to trying to draw people to Christ. And, and maybe you have seen some of the things I have seen, and maybe you're disturbed by some of the things you see when it comes to the gospel. And we ask ourselves, is this really the gospel, or is it really just kind of a, a social pattern that people want to claim is the gospel. And what I want to look at here tonight, it was asked for me by a congregation at home, and I thought we relate to some of the things that I have studied concerning the social gospel, and I hope that you enjoy it, and I hope that you'll, you'll be remindful that there is a pattern when it comes to the organization of the church. There is also a pattern when it comes to trying to encourage and edify one another, and we see those patterns in a universal perspective. We also see that pattern in a local church perspective. And, and um, if you want, I could preach on that next week because we've been talking about how it's important to have church membership. And we don't think that's something that we should really emphasize on. But you do see the necessity of a local congregation, the obligations to a local congregation, and the, and the duties that we have for a local congregation. I hope that you'll be encouraged by that as well. Tonight, I want to look at what we, when it comes to that social gospel. One of the things that we got to understand, there is a desire for popularity. And we want everyone to hear the message. And sometimes when it comes to that desire for everyone to hear the message, we get to a point where we veer off the beaten path of the gospel in order for people to listen to us. And that's a very dangerous idea when we try to get, uh, try to get this notion that, well, we need to draw people in. Uh, I've told you about on more than one occasion about the things that happened at Hillsong. And Hillsong, if you have followed along, they had really some great things that could happen. Let's put it that way. But the thing that got scary with that is they was worried about weighing the way in popularity. So therefore, they decided to do other things and things contrary to Scripture. And then it just became kind of a, uh, a slippery slope of sin, a slippery slope of, of kind of going away for the patterns of the church. And, and we see that they just tried to do things not really according to the Scriptures, but just really a desire to have that popularity. Not too long ago, uh, I remember that there was a guy that told me, he says, you need to come and listen to this guy preach the gospel. And uh, he was at a big congregation, and, and I remember going there and, and trying to say, well, let me hear what this guy has to say. Let me get something out of this message. Let me hear and, and, and be astounded like everybody else was astounded. He came in, and he talked, and people cheered, and people clapped their hands and thought that he was just fantastic. And here was my perception of it. I didn't get anything. And it wasn't for a lack of trying either. The thing I became disappointed in is he didn't talk 
anything concerning scripture. He didn't talk about what the, what we need to hear when it comes to the gospel. He really just talked about his own personal agendas and how he has achieved those agendas and didn't really bring any scripture to say, thanks be to God for this. <laughs> and, just, and, and people like to hear these success stories, but but... Brethren, this is not some kind of autobiography we should have up here in the pulpit. And we should not be some comedian box either, or some political agenda as well. And so many times we see people take those kind of notions and have failed to bring the gospel to individuals. And it's because there's that desire to be popular. We also see that there is this message that's more attractive to man. The past 20 years as I've been a preacher, I have seen the message really drastically change. I don't know about you. I know some of you have been a lot longer hearing message of Christ and, and, and preaching as I have. And maybe you say, no, it's been a lot longer than that. <laughs> and where the message has really changed into not really a, a, a message of, of the power of God and the power of his salvation and, and how we should cling to God, like the song, Cold to God's Unchanging Hand. No, we have kind of tried to focus on people. We have made it really man-centered, not really God-centered. And when we make it kind of man-centered, someone's going to be missed out in the mix, believe it or not. And then we also have some people that will take some of the truth, or maybe all the truth, that offends. We have been so scared that we're going to upset someone that we are willing to sacrifice the scriptures for it, believe it or not. And when we get to the notion that we're worried about offending someone, we have also made it a dangerous idea that there's no application to anyone. One of the things, to go back to that Hillsong, Hillsong situation, there was, a, uh, there was a young man that was very active in the congregation, but he was also openly gay. And for the longest time, they had no problem with him doing these things to the church and him having this kind of lifestyle. And then he has this desire to do bigger things. And when he had a desire to do bigger things, they said, no, 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 you can't do that. And they said, well, why not? He says, because you're gay. You want to be my next question? Why don't you stop me a little bit further back? Why do you think it's an issue now and it wasn't an issue when I was doing it three years ago? Why was it a big issue when I was trying to do all these things to help build up this congregation that you started? It caused a problem. It's because they were afraid to upset somebody. And there's where, once again, we become to preach these things, and we're trying to focus on lifestyles of the world and not really the lifestyles of God and Christ and have that like manner. And then we try to focus on these non-biblical elements of popular appeal. I talk about my friend Brian sometimes. He's from back in Tyler County. And Brian, Brian's got all these tattoos on him, and, and, and he's got piercings. And, and, you know, one of the things I tell Brian is, like, you don't realize how many people you could draw closer to Christ. And some people, when I say that, they probably think automatically, well, it's because of the way he looks. It's not necessarily the way he looks. It's the way he has transformed. When you look at the, Samar the, the Samaritan woman at the well, you see a transformation. You don't need to know she's from Samaria. You don't need to know about her past. You do need to know that when she heard about this water she never has to thirst for again, she was willing to drop everything and go back in town and tell people about it. But what is the reason why we bring up those things? Because we say to ourselves, the most unlikely individuals will listen. But we forget about the importance of that transformation. We forget about how this individual, no matter what the situation is, just like Paul tells us as that scripture was read there, and it tells us it doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what gender you are. It doesn't matter who you are because Christ is all in all. 
And when we try to focus on that, if we try to focus on the, what God expects from you and I, maybe we can bring some people closer to God. Think about this. What is our mission today? Brethren, our mission is to proclaim the truth. You look there, in Ephesians chapter 4, and, and you look at Ephesians chapter 4, and you go through 11 through 17, if I'm not mistaken, or 11 through 16. If you go to Ephesians chapter chapter 4, verses 11 through 16, it says, He gave some to apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we attain to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to measure the stature of the fullness of Christ, and so that we may be no longer tossed to and fro as uh, by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking in the truth in love, and we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And for whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint which is equipped. So when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. We have talked quite a while about how this needs to be active. How we need to be individuals when we come and we hear the message and no matter who's in the pulpit or who's doing the Bible study or who's leading the songs or who is doing the prayer or when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to be powerful, active agents when it comes to the worship of God. But brethren, do not forget that when we need that spirit, we also need that truth. Because Paul warns us when he talks there in the church of Corinth, if we start focusing on kind of just the knowledge for the sake of knowledge, then we are going to be carried away by every wind of doctrine. And we're going to think that there's some things that applies to us and some things that don't apply to us. And what Paul is trying to tell them here, especially the Ephesians, he says, you have put this group together and you need to work. Because there is going to be problems that come in the church. You know, one of the things I talked about in our study this morning of church membership is a lot of people will leave the building or leave the congregation or leave the church for pretty much hypocrisy or false teaching. And they'll say, well, because of this, that's why I'm not here. But the sad thing is that when it comes to a local congregation, we're not only ha we do not only have the responsibility to point out hypocrisy and point out false teaching, but we also need to deal with it. <laughs> Instead of taking the extremes and say, the first sign of danger, we were ready to go out the door. Or we go into such complacency where, uh, well, it's just their opinion and just their view that we just let any kind of sin creep in and undefile the body of Christ, which is that church. Brethren, we need to proclaim the truth. We need to continue to proclaim that truth. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, and if you go on to, to verse 16, and he tells us, he goes, I hope to come to you so soon, but I am writing these things so that you, if I delay, you know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God and the pillar of buttress of the truth. And great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. And he was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world and taken up in glory. When a person comes through that door, they should have the conclusion, I have come to a place to worship the living God. Last year, I think it was on Instagram. It was either on Instagram or it was on TikTok. It may have been on both. But there was a social media thing last year where this lady went into a church building and she threw a fit. And it went to a point 
that the cops had to be called. And they showed the cops talking to her. You could hear her voice being raised. She's all upset. She's angry. And they just went and they just asked her, why are, you, why are you mad? And why are you acting like this in front of people? Well, the thing was that they had a private birthday party in the church building. And she wanted to come in to the coffee house that they have in the church building to get her daily cup of coffee. That's why she was mad. Now, granted, she probably didn't have no reason to be that upset over a cup of coffee, but you should not be surprised either when that came up on social media, one of the first questions was asked, why would you do that in a church? And one replied, said, well, they didn't do it in the auditorium. They did it in the gymnasium. <laughs> and she replied, so? <laughs> do, we get, do we understand that we've gotten to the point, and it's not a surprise if you're looking at the financial side of it, it's not a surprise that there's people that is pushing the government to take away tax credits to congregations. And the reason being, and it's very rightfully so, we're no longer becoming a church, we've become a place of entertainment. And we've become a place of trying to, to bring people in for any old thing. Bring them in for coffee, bring them in for entertainment, bring them in for music, bring them in for everything but the gospel. <laughs> when I was trying to look that up, I was trying to remember when that happened. I came across this article where the Vatican, with Vatican money and Vatican property, bought a McDonald's. And you think that's funny. The Catholic people do not think that's funny. I think it's funny. <laughs> but the Catholic people is a different story. And what was the question that was asked? Why are we spend money for this? And then kind of top it off said, why would you spend money for that bad of food too? <laughs> but that's just it, brethren. There's not, we shouldn't be shocked when we have been threatened like this. You know, I get threatened like this because, you know, it's because... I use the tax credit, but it's funny that the things I preach on is put on the same parallel as a gymnasium. The, the time I come out here and present a message to you is on the same parallel as a coffee house. That should bother us. Now we have gotten to a point where we're not really a church anymore. We're in the entertainment business. We need to be about proclaiming the truth. It's, if so many people that tries to argue about all these experiences that they have when it comes to the work of church and says, this is for the church, then why are we putting so much emphasis on these experiences and not really putting on these, these emphasis on the church? If we bring people to Christ, we need to have a multi-purpose room. Really? How's that worked out for a lot of congregations? They may bring one or two people in, but they didn't bring a lot of people in. When I grew up in the Pentecostal church, we had a fellowship hall. And you knew when we had revivals, who was going to stick around for the meal and who was going to leave afterwards. And it was usually a packed house when we had a meal that night. But after the meal was done and, and they're putting away the dishes and the message has to be proclaimed, well, the building thinned out. <laughs> it's not some church of Christ issue. <laughs> it is a church problem. And brother, if we're not proclaiming the truth, we have no business being a church. Look there about what was taught in the gospel. Go to Romans chapter 1. Let's go back to Romans chapter 1 again and go to verses 15 through 17. And it tells us, he says, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I am not ashamed of that gospel, for it is the power of salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For it is in the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. 
why was Paul excited to come and preach the message? You ever notice that Paul says it's not, I'm not going to try to focus on one particular group here? Look how many today think that our worship needs to be centered around our youth. The youth of our future. The youth are, is our future. And we need to focus on, our, well, the youth is really your present. <laughs> it's never been your future. It's your present. Because if you say they're your future, you're not going to deal with them until the future. And you really need to deal with them now. <laughs> but there is those congregations that feel like they have to focus on the youth. Or those congregations that have to uh, the feed uh, and, and tend to the older generation or we should be centered around the millennials or centered around Generation X or we should be centered around in, in, in a black and white or Hispanic community. Uh, the worship needs to be centered around God. Remember last week? I think I said it here last week. I went to a congregation over, day t uh, over at Dayton High. Jason Reeder was there at the time, and he invited me to his congregation, and he invited me to speak there. And it was a dominant black congregation. And I had a blast. And the reason being is because they agreed with everything I said. <laughs> I could say, it's sunny out today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think it's going to rain tomorrow. Oh, amen, brother. <laughs> I mean, everything I said, it was either mm-hmm, amen, and it was just over and over again. It got me pumped. But here's the cool thing about this, brethren. The message didn't change at all. It is the same message that we speak about Christ here that I spoke about over in Dayton. The message doesn't change. And we think that because we go into a Hispanic community or we go to a black community or we go to a dominantly white community or we go to an older congregation or we go to a younger congregation, the message has to change. It does not. Paul never changed his message. <laughs> when the thing that was he told us, he says, I preach the gospel, and I'm excited to preach it to you in Rome. And then if you continue on there, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and if you start there in verse 1, he says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, and I was, uh, and my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I went and did a softball clinic over in Columbus. I've been over to Columbus a couple times at Broad Street. And there's a young man there named Jake Sturms. And actually, he's from around the Morgantown, or he's from uh, the Clarksburg Buchanan area, if I'm not mistaken. And I got to meet him and got to spend time with him and stuff. And, and the opportunity I had, I, I went to listen to him preach. <laughs> this was kind of his first line. Brethren, I'm going to have a very short sermon today. <laughs> and he was right. It was a very short sermon today. And the sermon that he preached was called Men of Iron. And maybe you've heard that before because I've preached it here. And one of the things that I got out of Jake's sermon was, this is really good. Whether it's 15 minutes or it's 50 minutes, it's pretty good. And he brought us some things for me to reflect on. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm going to work on this. I'm going to do like any other preacher does when he's trying to figure out something to preach on. He's going to steal it from somebody. <laughs> and I stole it from him. And I used that, and people has been encouraged and edified by it. And one of them was my son, Peyton. And he did just like any other preacher did. He stole the sermon from his dad, and he preached it over to Fairmont. He preached it over to Belleville, and they've been encouraged and edified by it. And then I took that sermon, and I went to Broad Street, and I preached it to them. 
And the reason I did that was not to show, hey, look, I did this a lot better than you did. No, that wasn't the point at all. I said, Jake, you look at this. You took a 15-minute sermon, and you say to yourself, wow, it's only short, and it doesn't really have a lot of meat, and, and, and maybe people will get disappointed by this. But it brought a guy to take it back home in his congregation and tell his brethren about it. It took my son to go to two congregations because he thought it was cool enough to tell other people about it. You took this 15-minute sermon, and you have filled the brethren with this seed of knowledge. It doesn't have to be this kind of a, we got this idea that if we do quick jokes and, and confusing speech, then it's a good message. But we also put ourselves in trouble when we don't put any lackluster in it, and, or we have lackluster in it when it's boring, we also feel that's a good message. <laughs> but the thing is, brethren, when we can get something out of this powerful message that we give, whether it's this morning, or it's this evening, or it's Wednesday, get something out of it. I think I told you about the, the girl that was down in Huntington. I remember she told me one time, she says, you know, I thought services was getting boring and boring. And instead of really going out and telling the preacher, hey, maybe you should spice up your sermons, she decided to take it upon herself and say, I'm going to get something out of this. And surprise, she did. Because, brethren, we're not just individuals that sit in a seat and say, here's my duty to sit in a chair or sit in a pew, and therefore, I'm done with all I need to do as a church today. That is not true. And that is very misguided. And it should not surprise us, so many people today say, I want Jesus, but I don't want the church. And it's because we got to put some power in this, not only from the guy in the pulpit, but the person in the audience as well. If you look there in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, where Paul tells us, he says, we have a ministry by the mercy of God. We do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And, and, and even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. And in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Christ's sake. The gospel must be taught. There was a guy I listened on YouTube, and he talked there not too long ago about how he got the Million Subscriber Award. And it's a pretty prestigious award to get a million individuals that decides that they want to listen to anything you have to say pretty much on a daily basis. And when he, he says that when he received this award, it was kind of bittersweet. It was pretty cool to have a million subscribers, but the thing that he questioned himself is, did I get a million subscribers because they wanted to hear the message of God, or did I get a million subscribers because they just wanted to hear this or maybe wanted to hear that? And he brings up this example of, of two things that he preached on. One of the things that he preached on was some of the satanic things that was found in Beyonce's latest album. And talked about how some of the horrible things that are said there could be maybe interpreted as satanic. Do you know how many people follow that? 800,000 watched that sermon. And this is the thing that he became disappointed with. He also preached another sermon. It was the seven last teachings of Jesus Christ. 14,000 people tuned in. That's why he was upset. Because as soon as Beyonce's name popped up, everybody wanted to know what he thought of it. But when Jesus Christ's name pops up, nobody doesn't want to listen. And sometimes that gets us to a point that we get discouraged and we say to ourselves, maybe we need to do something else. 
But brethren, don't think for one bit Paul had his problems. And don't think one bit that Peter had his problems. And don't think one bit when Christ in all his perfection and majesty did not have his problems with the Jewish brethren. That gospel must be preached. And also that gospel must be preached in its entirety. Look there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Paul says, he says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge, the living, and the dead, and by his appearing, appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready, in season, out season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching, for the time will come when people won't, won't endure sound teaching, but they will have itching ears, and they will accumulate for themselves teachers that suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And as for you, always be sober-minded and endure the suffering and do the work of the evangelist and fulfill your ministry. Paul's getting him ready because Paul's not going to be there. There's not going to be an opportunity for Timothy to say, what would Paul do? Or an opportunity to go to Paul and say, hey, I'm in this situation. I don't know about Brian, but there's many times I go to another preacher and I ask, hey, what do you think about this? Because I can't wrap my head around it. Maybe I'll talk to brethren about it. And I can't wrap my head around it, so I ask other guys. <laughs> now imagine this guy that is considered a youth to some, and there's going to be a point in his life that he's not going to have Paul to fall back on. There's not much talked about where Barnabas is. They don't know where Silas is half the time. And some of these guys that were with them are no longer with them. You know, we think about Demas. Demas was with them for a spell. Now he is forsaken. Anesimus was with them, but he went back because he was in trouble. <laughs> and Paul's telling him, when it's you that has to take the turn, preach the message. And don't skip out on something. You know, there's been times I have attempted to cook. And sometimes they have not been very successful. And the reason being is because I do miss out on maybe one important ingredient. You may think it's not, it's obvious to miss out the chocolate chips and the chocolate chip cookies. Oh, well, that's a big problem there, Jay. But what about the vanilla extract? <laughs> that's a little bit important too. Not much. <laughs> You wouldn't think it'd be missed, but it is. <laughs> if we miss out on something, we know that it's not the cookie that we want. And it's the same way with the gospel. If we leave out some of the things that people need to hear about the gospel, it's not the gospel either. A few things, and then the lesson will be yours. One of the things I find interesting when it comes to the history of the social gospel, is it's always seeking another place. It has institutions seeking another place. It's interesting that if you talk to a lot of the liberal congregations, if you will, of today, and you tell them about institutionalism, or if you want to study on institutionalism, more than likely a majority of them would say, what's that? And it's because they never had to deal with the issues of orphanage homes or never had to deal with the issues of, of, uh, of newspapers and radio programs. And it's because they have done it for so long that it's never been an issue because they have always done it that way. <laughs> and they don't think it's a big deal. <laughs> and now, we, if you think about it, think about how long ago radio has really been a factor. We're on the internet now. We're on TV now. 
We do a variety of things, and radio is just kind of a small fraction of what it used to be. And we have done bigger and better things. And institution that does that, institutionalism does that. It finds a way to find a better mousetrap. And all the while they think that they're doing this thing and it's going to draw people. It doesn't really draw people. They just draw the individuals who are interested in those things. It's not has anything really with the gospel. It's the things that you have enticed them with. It's the same way that we have become to address social ills. <laughs> While we need to preach things in season, out of season, it seems like sometimes we make this kind of a bully pulpit. I hope some of you understand when I say a bully pulpit. And it seems like we go out and we try to attack anyone who is against us. <laughs> and we really tried to do, not really to bring people closer to God, we tried to do an emphasis of pushing them farther away. Or we try to find ways to attract the numbers to succeed. We think if a church is successful, then it has to have a large number in its congregation. And it's gotta have a lot of money, and it's gotta have a big auditorium, and it's got to have the most eloquent speakers, and they got to be paid very well, too. And we have great leadership, and we have great classes, and we, and we say in order to be a successful congregation, you got to have this. And that's been kind of the mentality of televangelism for quite some time now. And also... We think that we got to do these things by entertainment. There's a couple pictures I want to show you here. And like I said, the lesson will be yours. Maybe some of you remember this lady. Her name is Amy Grant. And this also may show my age, too. But Amy Grant was really popular in the early 90s. And I don't think some people realize that she was also a Christian singer. And she'd done a lot more music and a lot more albums and a lot more, and she got a few more awards when she was a Christian singer. But the way she rose to stardom is when she put the Christian music aside and started to focus on pop music. That didn't really focus on God. It focused on things that was going on in her life and not spiritual things that was going on in her life. She talks about her relationship with her husband, which is Vince Gill. She talks about the relationship she has with her child. That's where baby, baby comes from. The way she rose to stardom wasn't because of God or wasn't because she focused on God. It was because she focused on the things of the world. Maybe some of you remember the group Striper. Once again, this is showing my age because <laughs> it's a hair band. Back in the 80s, Striper made this statement. He sa they said, we are rock and roll evangelists. Striper is a modern day John the Baptist crying in the world of rock for those who don't have a life to of Christ to turn on the light switch. And when it became popular, it was, was one song, honestly. And if you look at the lyrics and you try to listen to what the lyrics is all about, yeah, maybe you can make an argument that maybe you're talking about this devotion to God, but it sounds like it's a devotion to a significant other. And then South Ta Southtown popped up, or P.O.D., Payable on Death. And I didn't realize and this is, shows my age as well, <laughs> I didn't realize that they put out a song called Southtown. And for the longest time, I didn't realize they were a Christian band. Because Southtown was about the struggles of growing up in Southern California. But they talk about this message that they have about bringing divine inspiration through their music. 
And then there was another group called Skillet. And, and, and my point with all this is simple. And I'm not telling you you should listen, you should not listen to any of these individuals. That's not my point here. My point here is when they tried to make this idea that they went to go about trying to bring music and trying to bring people to God through their music, the only time they were ever successful was through their devotion to the world. And I bring this idea of these groups to tell you that there's many other avenues that people put out there today and try to present the gospel, but it's so far away because it's so focused on people that it has nothing to do with God. The things that we need to be doing, brethren, is we need to preach the pure gospel of Christ, not only in spirit, but also in truth. And we need to practice what is authorized by Scripture. And one of the things I kind of quizzed my brethren on this morning, I said, where do you find in Scripture where it says, speak where the Bible speaks and be silent where the Bible silence? And one person who said out loud says, there's no Scripture like that. I said, you're exactly right. <laughs> it's from an individual by the name of Alexander Campbell. And he tried to promote that idea when he started his work in evangelism back in the early 1800s. But how many times, brethren, have you heard a preacher say that? I know I have. And I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it, but just consider the source. <laughs> Let's not change the gospel for popularity. Colin Cowherd said it best when he talked about sports teams doing certain things, and it just seems like it's taken away from the nature of the sport. And he said it very justly, and I'm kind of paraphrasing what he says. He goes, if you really want to build a fan base, you're going to lose some of your followers. Now take that in a religious perspective. If you really want to build a fan base here, you're going to make some of your local people angry. And unfortunately, in the process, when you do that, you're taken away from probably the scriptures and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's not change the work of the church from spiritual to social. 2 John 9, I'm going to read out of the Christian Standard Bible because I think it's a little bit more, it gets the point across when we don't say, Whoever transgresses and abide not in the, in the doctrine has not God. But what the Christian Standard Bible says is anyone who goes beyond Christ's teaching and does not remain in it does not have God. We're going outside the lines. And that's what John is trying to say here. When we go outside the lines, we are no longer trying to be with God. We're trying to be God. Let's focus on the salvation of sin. Brethren, I hope you've been encouraged by this. And, and let's practice something biblical here now that we find in Scripture. We have an opportunity if someone has not been baptized into Christ, there's a reason why that message is spoken over and over and over again. And it's because there is a necessity involved in it. And this is why we have taken our resources and we made sure that there is a baptistry here. And we make sure that there is clothes to change into. And we make sure that there is individuals that is capable of baptizing you. And the reason being is very simple because we see through Christ's teaching, we see through Paul's teaching, we see through Peter's teaching, all inspired by God, how important it is to have this available to you when you want the opportunity. And the only one that could deny you in baptism is you. If you come up here tonight and you say, I want to be baptized in Christ, and I tell you no, don't worry, they'll probably kick me out and they'll have somebody come and baptize you in the Christ. <laughs> Sometimes I feel that way. No, I'm just kidding. 
when it comes to repentance, look how many times Christ tells us about making a change. That's the power of the gospel as well. When we hear that message and we say to ourselves, I need to do something about it. And that's available here tonight. Maybe we need to pray about something. There's a reason why Jesus put out a pattern of how important it is to pray. And emphasize that not only from his command, but also has done it through his example as well. And we could do something about that. If we're struggling with something, maybe if we want to just give glory to God tonight, that's fine too. Whatever the case may be, let's not neglect the opportunity to pray tonight. And if we need to respond, let's do so now. While we stand, while we sing.